develop in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this, your holy word, and the many ways in which you use it in our lives. Lord, as I come this day, I pray that you would forgive me of anything that would stand in the way of my service to you and this, your people. I pray that the message that is given and the words that are spoken will be yours. And Father, above all of that, I pray that the way that it has an effect on our hearts and our lives will be according strictly to your will. And as we gather as your people in your name, we pray all of these things. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So today I'm going to talk about convenient grace. If you guys have a list of scriptures uh, that was available to you when you came in. And uh, I, I made that list available because I'm going to touch on a lot of them, but I'm not going to spend as much time. I'm not going to read each one, otherwise we can hear quite some time. Uh, the scripture for the, the text today, though, is from Ephesians 2, the first 10 verses. So Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, At one time you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and of the, because of your offenses against God. You used to live like the people of this world, and you followed the rule of destructive spiritual power. Now this is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. Now they've never been like that, right? Just check it. Okay. At one time you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever you felt was good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did it to show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possess. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. <clears throat> God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. <clears throat> now, I don't know how you guys grew up, but I grew up in church. I, was, I had a drug problem, right? You know, I heard that old joke. You know, my parents drug me to church. My grandparents drug me to church. The neighbors drug me to church. Anytime there was church, I was going to be in church one way or the other. And I'm grateful for that. Because what that allowed to, uh, to happen in my life was it allowed people to show me God's love a long time before I even had any idea what it meant. I was the only person, a young person, in that small church in Milano, small Methodist church. And whenever I came, uh, they included me in whatever I did. And, and I was, like I was saying while I go, I did. Man, I, for, I think I had perfect years of attendance uh, at, that, at that church. So I acolyte and I handed out bulletins, whatever it was. There was always somebody that had a Sunday school lesson prepared for me. And, that, and that's how I started to learn and experience God's grace and God's love, even though I had no idea what it was. I was clueless about that. But yet here these people were loving on me, and, and that's why it's important for me to see our youth engaged in different uh, parts of our service. You know, this is part of how we show God's love to them and prepare them to understand what it is. All of this happened for me so that later in life, when I began to understand some things, the stage was set for the revelations that God had in store. So over the next few weeks when I speak, I'm going to talk about grace. We're going to talk a lot about grace for the next five weeks. Now, in the New Testament, uh, you know that's written in Greek. So the word, the root meaning of the word that we translate into the English word for grace is gift. So when I, when I talk about grace, think about it as a gift. And I, I mentioned this last week. If you give a gift, you're not giving it because you expect something in return. You're giving it, if it's a true gift, you're giving it with no strings attached. And it's, it's exactly that. It's a gift. It's from you to somebody else. And that's what this word grace really is, is you know, that's what the root meaning is. We 
find this uh, this meaning in Ephesians 2 and 2 Corinthians 5. And we see in these scriptures that God offers us this gift through Christ of a relationship that includes salvation, reconciliation, and eternal life. And I've talked to you guys about, to me, what eternal life really means. It's not, it's not about what happens after we die. Eternal life is about the quality of relationship that we have with God and one another. It's about the quality of, and the wholeness of our relationship. And that's, what, that's exactly what it is that God offers to us in this gift of grace. Um, as explained by John Wesley and many of the others of his time, uh, we as Methodists understand God's grace as one grace with many facets. And we're going to talk about one of those today. But to give you an overview, uh, the way that we experience grace is with different words. We call one of them prevenient grace. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the next one is justifying grace. And the last one is sanctifying grace. These, these words relate to the different stages in our faith journey. And I say journey because our faith is supposed to be dynamic. It's supposed to continue to develop and grow every day of our life. John Wesley said it like this. He said, I'm going on to perfection. I'm not everything God wants me to be just yet. But today I'm a little bit more like Christ than I was yesterday. And tomorrow I want to be more like Christ than I am today. So he said, I'm going on to perfection, and our journey should be the same way. So the nature of grace is similar to the nature of God. If, you, you know, if you're trying to kind of put this in some kind of context, we have God who is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have this one grace uh, that we express in different ways, provenient, justifying, and sanctifying. Now, provenient grace means that God is with us throughout our lives. This is the grace that is most clearly at work from the time of our conception all the way up to the time of our conversion. And it doesn't matter whether we accept Christ at the age of 12 or 25 or 50 or 95. Uh, God's work is, is around us and in our lives. And if we're paying attention, we're going to experience it uh, from the time that we're conceived all the way up until the time that we accept Christ. Um, God's always after. The term prevenient comes from the Latin word prevenere, and it means to come before. So in our Christian theology, uh, this word means that it's the grace of God that comes before any decision that we can make or any endeavor on our part to understand. It's God's work, like I said a while ago, when I was a child, I had no idea what was going on, but I was experiencing all of this, and it was part of what God was doing to show me his love before I even knew what it was. And it's the same with us. So provenient grace also enables us to recognize God's works, and it empowers us to respond as well. I was able to accept Christ at a revival at the age of about 12 because of all the things that I had experienced prior to that. All the things that God had been doing in my life that made a difference led up to that one event where I was able to understand what was being offered and accept it for myself, or at least... I thought I was able to understand it. You know, every day is a new revelation about what that, that relationship is supposed to be about. Now, in Revelation 22, we see that uh, prevenient grace is the love of God wooing us like a bridegroom courting his bride. Anybody in here ever wooed your mate? You might have done a few things that you don't want anybody else to know, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, that's... That's what we do. Yeah, I see a bunch of grins out there, some from the guys, some from the girls. But, yeah, sometimes we, we do some things because we want to go above and beyond. We want, to, we want to emphasize our love for someone else. You see, when you love someone, it draws them closer. And that's what God is all about. In John 6, 44, we find that provenient grace is the will of God drawing us closer to <coughs> Provenient grace is the desire of God pursuing us throughout our lives to bring us into friendship with God. When you read the first uh, handful of verses in Romans 5, you, you, see, you see how this is expressed. And in fact, in, in Romans 5, we also see that this, this provenient grace enables us to be at peace with God. And I want to say that because when you read that scripture, you're going to, think, you're going to scratch your head and say, wow, I, I don't want to be at war with God. And that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual matter. See, the spirit that we have in us is a gift from God. It's his spirit, and it desires to be in relationship with God. 
And so until we have that relationship, we're, we're having this spiritual battle go on back and forth inside of us. And that's why Paul wrote that, that it enables us to be at peace with God. Because until we have that relationship, until we've accepted Christ in the way we're supposed to, our spirit's not at peace. And that's what Paul is getting at, is he wants us to have that, that peace. Uh, Francis Thompson wrote a very powerful poem. It's an old poem. I think it's from the 1800s. And it describes this pursuit of us by God. It's entitled uh, The Hound of Heaven. And it, it kind of likens God, uh, his pursuit of us, his relentless pursuit of us, to kind of like a bloodhound. You know, when somebody gets out, they put a hound on their trail, and they just they just pursue relentlessly until they catch up. Well, that's, that's how God is as he pursues us in our lives. In Romans 8 and 1 John 4, we find that it's the gift of God freeing us. I love that, that uh, prayer. I want to go to the prayer of the people. Freeing us so that we might have the opportunity to respond to God's offer of the relationship and to place our trust in Jesus Christ. Again, in Romans 5, it's the activity of God empowering us, giving us spiritual strength. You know, the, the message in the Bible is very clear. We're created in God's likeness, and we're created for this relationship that God desires. If you go back and look at the, the first few chapters in Genesis 1 especially, you find that God says in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth and the cosmos and everything in it. And he called it all good. And that includes human beings. It, mean, it includes mankind. He created us in his image, spiritually. Uh, he created us for this, this in a likeness of him, for this relationship to take place. When God created mankind, the relationship between God and man was deep and spiritual. And it's still supposed to be that way even today. Like Adam and Eve, each of us is a unique and beloved child of God. However, like Adam and Eve, we've all made some mistakes. But the good news is, God is love. We find that in 1 John 4. And each of us has the capacity to love and be loved. Anybody here ever watch any of the forensic shows? You, you, know, you know, the ones, the whodunics. One of the things that they're always looking for uh, to find out who did something is DNA, right? Because DNA identifies an individual and shows you who they are. And if you find their DNA at the crime scene, well, you've got a pretty good idea of who did the crime. That, that gives you the identifying fact the, that, that shows you their identity. Well, it's no different with us as Christians. Uh, you could say that love is God's DNA in each of us. What's that song? And they'll know we are Christians by our, uh, yeah, by our love. Yeah. Jesus says that to his disciples. This is how they'll know who you are, that you're my disciples, is when you love one another, how you love each other. See, uh, sometimes we forget the fact that we, we lose the, the context. We, we misinterpret. We start to think of ourselves as physical bodies with the spirit, when in reality, we're not that at all. We're actually spirits that happen at this point in time to have a physical body. And so it's important for us to think about that because in, in John 4, we find that God is spirit. So we're, if we're created in his image and likeness, then we're spiritual beings. So you could say that we're wired for God. Anybody in here do any electrical work? Not good. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to mess things up. I'm just saying. Bill's got that look on his face like he's guilty. Yeah. What, do you know what happens when you get the wires crawl? It's bad. Do you know what happens if you plug in AC to DC? It's bad. Uh, sometimes I think that we, we don't realize that we're wired in a certain way, if you will, for the relationship with God. And when we're trying to do it differently, it's bad. Uh, I think a lot of times, too, we think of our, our, our wiring in small ways with small fuses, you know, like the little fuses on the four-wheelers, the little 10 amp fuses. What God has in store for us is so much more. We ought to be thinking of our wiring in terms of large cables with massive fuse boxes because that's the power that God has in store that he would like to express through us and our lives to others. Now, because we're created in the image and likeness of God, the deepest and most essential parts of us longs for a relationship with God. There's a, there's a saint from way back, and I'm talking 1,700 years ago or 1,800 years ago, named Augustine. 
And Augustine had a writing that he called, or that was entitled Confessions. And in there, he has a quote that is still very popular to theologians today. And his quote is, our hearts will not find rest until they find rest in thee. He's talking about God. And the way I look at that is, do y'all like to do puzzles? Anybody here like puzzles? I don't like puzzles. Linda likes these 5,000 piece puzzles. I don't like them because every time I walk by, they're scattered out. And I, I just want to stop and get it put together and done. And I want it to be quick and easy. And every piece looks like the other. They all look similar in shape. And when you think you got one, it never fits. Now, she likes that. I don't. I like Josh's old puzzles, you know, when he was six. They're this big and they have like 25 pieces. You know, the color cap, yeah, the color pattern is really easy. John and I, uh, Josh and I could rip through that in about 25 seconds and I would be happy. <laughs> the world wants you, it's like that puzzle. The world wants you to think that it has all the pieces to fill the hole in your heart. But I think we have a God-shaped hole and only God can fill that, that hole. And those pieces are very specific. Now, when we look for God, we're going to see the right piece, and it's going to fit, and it's going to satisfy. But the world wants to confuse you with all these other pieces and get you to think that it has the right answer. That's not correct. It, it, it only takes, it only, you can only find the satisfaction for God. Now, the good news is, in Genesis, um, that our origin in God precedes mankind's mistakes. You know, if you go back and look, find that we're created in God's likeness a long time before Adam and Eve mess up. Well, I'm grateful for that because it shows me the priority of such things. But even after Adam and Eve made wrong choices in the, in the garden that cost them their place and brought disorder to all of creation, we find that in Genesis 3 and Genesis 6, God still provided for them. Each of us has made these mistakes, like I said a while ago. I don't know about y'all, maybe I'm just speaking for me. Y'all ever made a mistake? You ever made a wrong choice? You ever, you ever done something you hope nobody find out about? Then later they do. But yeah, especially nowadays. I mean, everybody's got a phone and they take videos of everything. So you're gonna, you're gonna, yeah, okay. Well, here's the good news: God's grace and God's love are greater than all of our wrong choices. Another way to put that is: there's always more grace in God than there is sin in us. And God continues to offer the relationship to us that he desires to have. In Jeremiah 31, we find that God desires a relationship with us even more than we want the relationship with God. We find that the nature of this relationship is a nature uh, such that it is covenant love. See, a covenant is the strongest form of relationship that is identified in the Bible. It's a relationship that God defines, and it's very binding. Uh, we find in Genesis 9, the covenant between God and Noah. In Genesis 15, between he and Abraham. In Exodus 19, with, between he and Moses and the Israelites. In 2 Samuel, we find the relationship, the covenant relationship between God and King David. Go and read Ezekiel 12 or Hosea 3, and you find the prophets repeatedly calling the Hebrew people back into a genuine relationship of love and obedience to God. In Jeremiah 31, they proclaim God's promise to make a new covenant with God's people. Jesus offers us a new covenant and a new relationship with God in Luke 22 and Matthew 28. It's a relationship of love and grace that we find in John 13 and again back here in Ephesians 2. In, in John 1, we find that this is a divine love. In Ezekiel 34 and Luke 19, we find that it's a seeking love, seeking after us. In John 13 and Psalm 136, we see it defined as an everlasting love. And in John 3:16. It's a gift of pure love. In Genesis 3, we find that God takes the initiative to seek us. After Adam and Eve made their mistakes, it's God who's out in the garden calling for them. Now, we experience this divine initiative as grace. In Romans 5 and Luke 15, we find provenient grace helps us to overcome our brokenness and our alienation from God. Because, let's face it, there's times in our life we're, we're pretty broken. I don't know about y'all, but but there's just times when things, we're not right, okay? And God continues to do works around us and in us to call us back into the right kind of relationship. Now, there's a lot of ways that we experience convenient grace. And I talked about my growing up in church. That was one of the ways. But it even continued 
after I had accepted the relationship uh, with Christ. Um, you know, I talked about getting those perfect attendance pins. But then I graduated, and I had the college experience, you know. And I, I quit going to church. I, all of a sudden, other things got more important. I got a girlfriend that was out of town, and so I spent time, you know, uh, running back and forth. And they didn't go to church, and I didn't go to church. And then one, you know, several years later, well, she dumped me. And uh, I was taken advantage of, a little cute little cheerleader. Uh, you know, anyway, caught me on a rebound. Uh, fortunately, though, this uh, Glenda uh, happened to be somebody that did go to church and that did love the Lord. And so uh, after um, we got married, uh, we continued our, our, uh, for a while at church, and she was uh, going to church and doing things, and then wasn't long before. Several years later, we got a family going, and we're back involved in the church that I grew up in, in Milan. And uh, in 1995, after becoming more and more involved in the church there, we moved to Huntsville and began to be involved in a larger church in different ways, teaching Sunday school and different leadership capacities. But God's provenient grace was still at work. Um, we, we both moved down there and went to work for a gentleman who died not long after we got there. We'd already bought our house. For the next four years, uh, through 1999, uh, things were were really hard at work, to say the least. Uh, different ownerships, different pressures, different things going on. Uh, some folks that you just really hate to be around a lot. And so in August of 1999, I found myself really on my knees in prayer for about a week. Uh, and it was an amazing thing. But it was the only place I had left that I could turn for some relief. I like the children's sermon today. The same talked about God being with us. And there during that week, it felt like the last thing I was aware of at night was God's presence. And the first thing the next morning, again, God's presence. And the things that were going on, I felt like God was part of every conversation that I had. But what was going on is God was preparing me for something. And after about a week of that prayer, I realized that he was calling me to minister. And so I answered that call of prayer. Again, God's word going before anything that I could do or even imagine. And so God's provenient grace at work in my life. Um, I answered the call of ministry in August. And by November, the district superintendent had placed me in a small church. And we were very blessed to be there for several years. So sometimes we experience God's provenient grace to events, positive and negative. The Holy Spirit can speak to our minds and our hearts through the struggles, frustrations, and difficulties of life. Even through the pain of unemployment, even through the pains of divorce, sometimes through the loss of a loved one. The Spirit can also speak to us according to John 16 through music or art or beauty. And I, I still have songs that, that just overwhelm me because of what they mean to me in my relationship with God. It's God's Spirit uh, speaking to me, calling to me. Sometimes we experience provenient grace through the care and sacrifice of others. Uh, God's love is embodied toward us in these examples. We find uh, examples of that in 2 Timothy. Um, sometimes we experience provenient grace through the body of believers, the church. The things that we did yesterday reached out to people. The things that were done in the small church when I was growing up. Provenient grace at, at, at work. Sometimes we experience God's provenient grace through the Holy Spirit awakening our consciousness. Convincing us that we can't do this by ourselves. That we have to find God. Sometimes we experience it through the Holy Spirit wooing us, recording us, or calling to us. And sometimes we experience provenient grace through our actions to others as we reach out uh, with love or, or, or thanks to them. The critical question for us today is will we open our hearts to God and accept the full relationship that God offers to us in Jesus Christ, this full relationship, this full gift of grace? Some folks will sit by 12 inches. You know, that's, you've heard that. That's the distance between your, your head and your heart. You know what to to say up here. You know all the right things. You know what the scriptures say up here. But you really don't have it down here. And that's where it's important. So I have to ask, what about you? As you sit here today, have you fully accepted what God offers in Christ? Wesley explained provenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace by using the analogy of a house. Uh, what he said was, it's like this. 
or, you know, I've just come from working cows, and that's white shed carpet. Uh, so I can't go in. And I look in there, and I see that leather couch and that beautiful upholstery, and I just can't go in there. Or maybe I look in the fine china that's put out just for me on the table, but I'm thinking, you know, paper plates are more my style. God continues to woo and court and invite and prepare. Y'all know the difference between a guest and a visitor, right? Visitors catch you unaware. You're not prepared for them. You wonder why in the world they show up right now. Guests, however, you've been preparing for them all along. Even if you didn't know who they were going to, you're ready to receive them. That's the way the church is supposed to be. You're ready to receive them whenever they show up. See, God has prepared for us. Jesus says, a place to, to, to live with you in the house. So Wesley says that, that's that front porch. Well, God invites you in, and when you decide to accept a relationship and you step through that door and go into the house and you begin to experience the beauty, now you're in that relationship, and that's justifying grace. And then with sanctifying grace, you continue to go with God throughout the whole house and you experience all the beauty of the many rooms and you just continue to grow. That's how John Wesley the different facets of grace. But where are you today? Are you on the floor looking in? Thinking maybe you're too dirty or not good enough to go into such a nice house? We got a, we got a dog named Daisy. Daisy's not allowed in the house. She's a good dog. She's an Australian shepherd. And I love her. But she's not allowed in the house. So she's a porch dog. She's always out there on the porch. Always out there on the porch. That's her place. It's not like that for us. See, God is inviting us into this, this relationship for a more fullness of understanding, for a more full relationship with Christ. He's inviting us, but He doesn't force us. It's up to us to accept it and to come inside. Are you still on the porch? Maybe you're still on the porch in certain areas of your life. Where are you at in your relationship with God and His gift of grace? Or have you come into the house and you're experiencing all that God has and you're continuing to grow and evolve in your faith and understand more and more and experience this, this gift of love? Don't be like me.